Hello and welcome to Mechanics Institute's Writer's Lunch. We hold our Writer's Lunches every third Friday of the month, and we are glad that you are joining us for our August Writer's Lunch on balancing authorship and publishing with our two fabulous speakers, Ginny Grossenbacher and Osiris, with our fabulous moderator, Cheryl bizet Boutte. Uh, my name is Alyssa Stone. I'm the Senior Director of Programs and Community Engagement here at Mechanics Institute, and I'm very happy to welcome you all on this lovely Friday. I hope everyone's doing well from wherever you are joining us from. For those who are less familiar with Mechanics Institute, uh, we were founded in 1854. Mechanics Institute is a historical landmark, cultural center, gorgeous library, world-renowned chess program, and events center. We do anywhere from five to 15 events per week with our writers and reading community, our chess community, uh, cinema lit. We have all sorts of fabulous events both online and on-site at Mechanics Institute. So we hope that you'll check out more programming with us at milibrary.org. Uh, and we hope to see you again at another Mechanics Institute event. We also offer free tours every Wednesday at noon. If you are new to Mechanics Institute or it's been a while since you've come by, join us on a Wednesday tour. It's a fabulous way of seeing the entire building, all of its fabulous nooks and crannies and learning about our history and our contemporary offerings. And of course, please mark your calendars for the Writer's Lunch next month on Friday, September 15th for the topic, The Art of the Anthology. Moderated by Cheryl bizet Boutte. this session will feature E.A. Provost from New Alexandria Creative Group, Jennifer Bassier-Sander from Big City Books Group, and Sarah Beal from Colossus Press. And I will add that link to the chat shortly as well so you can all get yourselves registered for the next Writer's Lunch that we offer. I am pleased to do some brief introductions for our featured guests today. We have, of course, the woman of the hour, our award-winning author and Pushcart nominee, Cheryl J. bizet Boutte, who is an <laughs> Oakland multidisciplinary writer whose autobiographical and fictional short story collections, along with her lyrical and stunning poetry, artfully succeed in getting across deeper meanings about the politics of race and economics without breaking out of the narrative. An inaugural Oakland Poet Laureate runner-up, she is also a popular teacher, literary reader, presenter, storyteller, curator, and MC host for literary and poetry events. We are always pleased to have Cheryl as our moderator for the Writer's Lunch. We have our two guests today, Ginny Grossenbacher, uh, Masters of Education, novelist, poet, certified editor, educator, and publisher who founded Elk Grove Writers and Artists in 2012 and JGKS Press in 2017. Ginny brings 36 years of experience teaching English, language, arts to adult adolescents and adults, and Ginny is an award-winning indie poet, historical novelist, and forensic historian, and a certified copy editor. She is an experienced conference presenter and a favorite speaker at book clubs, fairs, and festivals. And we have award-winning author Osiris, who has written and published books such as his award-winning poetry book, Sacred, and his children's book, Goodbye John, via his imprint, Osiris Inc. Publishing. Osiris is a storyteller who primarily focuses his books on poetry and children's stories. However, he has written a romantic novel, graphic novel, and a psychological thriller to be published in the future. We are very grateful to have Ginny and Osiris joining our conversation with Cheryl today. And with that, I will pass it to Cheryl. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Alyssa, so much. And thank you, Mechanics Institute. And also thank you, Ginny and Osiris for being with us today. I hope to have a really wonderful, in-depth and informative conversation with you both. As you know, it's often very difficult for writers to get published by large mainstream publishers. And as one of those writers who's an indie writer, self-published, I am very, very thankful for the small independent presses like yours and for the work you do as writers in the community and publishers to support authors like me. 
And I guess my first question for you is if I were envisioning going out on that limb of the pub publishing limb and not just the writing limb, which came first for you, writing or publishing? And then how did you put them together? Uh, Osiris, can you take that on first? Osiris? There we go. Am I good? Yeah, you're good. Okay, I'm talking to myself over here. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> having a good conversation, huh? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah. So, um, I started off with writing first. The idea of publishing a book. Are you talking about just publishing a book or becoming a, or a publisher itself? I'm talking about how did you put together writing and being an author, and then being a publisher. How did you oh. meld, how do you meld them together, and which came first for you? Oh, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. So, um, I did writing first. Um, decided just, you know, um, create some stories. I don't have, um, multiple ideas of wanting to do some sort of poetry since I've been writing for, for many years prior to that. Um, the idea to even do it as a publisher, um, didn't really resonate until I was doing a lot of research on if I wanted to go the traditional publishing route or the self-publishing route. And when, uh, in that research, I was learning that, um, there's not really a big difference in terms of being the author and being the marketer for it. I had learned that even if you're a traditional publisher, uh, even if you're traditionally published author, you still have, you're still responsible for a lot of the marketing um, aspects. You might have a marketing team with the traditional publishing, but it's still you as the author that's going out. So um, I guess I intertwined it both me doing the writing and just doing some research on, hey, what can I actually, how can I blend the two together? And uh, I suppose <laughs> that's how I did it. Wow, that's really interesting. How about you, Jenny? Well, I was, I've, I've always written, right? Um, probably just like Osiris. I mean, when I was a little girl, I used to write up little scripts for us to dress up in my sister's, big sister's clothes and clomp around in their high heels. And uh, all the kids in the neighborhood would come over for the plays. And, uh, you know, I always wrote little stories, poems and all that. And I was an English major. And so you know, it was always in my bones to write. And so as an English teacher, you know, I wrote with my students. And then I got an agent um, when I retired from teaching and I decided um, I wanted to go traditional. Well, we, we were read by 10 publishing houses. This was my first novel. And, um, and each one said, well, you're more of a mid-list author and we're only publishing really sort of what's cutting edge right now. And uh, you are going to be competing against, and then they gave me all the big names and they said, you're not quite at that place. And my agent suggested to me after a year of trying to get published that I might consider founding my own press. And um, he gave me some counsel on that. And then he gave me a bunch of websites to look up. And this was in 2017. So um, writing clubs were still, you know, at that place where traditional publishing was cachet, uh, self-publishing was still a little bit tainted by vanity presses. And, um, but I had enough encouragement from people who had done the step before and they kind of guided me. Um, and so I published uh, Madam of My Heart, my first one, and found it to be really interesting an interesting journey I had to get out there I know Osiris gets out there too because that's where we met was you know the Berkeley Book Fest but but that whole idea of meeting your readers meeting the public talking to people about your books and I find that to be very satisfying um, it's scary at times you know you're on the edge of your seat wondering you know when's the next marketing opportunity coming along but things have opened up now and the, the, the taint is off the whole idea of, of self-publishing now and founding your own press and working with other authors. It's, it's really joyful. So, so Jenny, just, just as a follow on, and I'll, I'll ask you this also, Osiris, how important or what, what is the difference between self-publishing and having an imprint as a writer? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. You hear those terms all the time. Yeah. So, you know, what's what's the difference? Well, I when I uh, examined the difference for myself, um, I I had to have in mind my future. What what was it that I wanted? And I wanted to found an imprint so that I could publish other people as well. And I was in a place, which I'm sure Osiris is too, where we have a community, you know, that we work with, whether or not it's co colleagues that we write with. We have, we have some kind of writing community that is around us. And so many of them uh, wanted help editing. They wanted help critiquing. They wanted help publishing. And so I said, well, gee, if I found uh, a small boutique press, then maybe I can publish their work as well and help them on their journey. So I sort of expanded my vision from just myself to then being able to help my writing community, which is what I did. And Osiris, what for you, what's, what's the difference between self-publishing with your name on the book that you're writing and um, in, an imprint? For me, it's actually pretty similar um, as well to Jenny's, but like for, well, for my reason, um, I wanted to have ownership entirely of my work uh, from the copyright to the to the trademark of my logo and to being able to go out and do things without the worry of them like bookstore owners or um, or store managers asking, hey, well, we actually got to run this through the publishing company in order to get permission to put this this particular book into our bookstore while well, i'm actually the person in charge of it is my is my imprint and being able to have the freedom to do things like that as well and also giving other people opportunities like my sister-in-law who had always wanted to be a writer uh, her name is um erica um reyes she had always wanted to be a writer but never really had the means to go mm -hmm. about trying to publish a book and so i told her hey you know uh, i can help you I can go and I'm not going to ask for any money or anything like that. I'll help you the entire process and just being able to provide a platform for others to share their story. And uh, like you had mentioned, like no poetry, no peace, right? And poetry, there's power behind it. And she had a, um, a story that she wanted to tell. And I'm not sure if she would have gotten that same opportunity had she gone the self-publishing route without actually having knowledge of how to market it, having knowledge on how to promote herself or even having knowledge on how to how to write it and where to go. And so for me, just having my own imprint, I guess the biggest difference is if it's just me, Osiris, as the author, it doesn't really differentiate me from anybody else that's also an author. And not to discredit that because I think that's awesome as well. Um, I kind of look at Tyler Perry as a as a as a um as a source of motivation of he said to build your own table. And so that's what I did as well. Built my own imprint, aka my own tape, my own table, and put all my things in it. You know, I um and helping out others as well. Oh, it's wonderful information, both of you. Thank you. Um, you're both prolific authors as well. So, and, and Osiris, I'll ask you first. Um, what techniques do you use or employ to achieve balance between um, your writing life and your publishing life? Oh man, it's it's. It's actually really tricky because I also have to incorporate my military lifestyle into it as right, well. Right, right. And then my, and then my and children. And your daddy, and your daddy lifestyle. Yes, <laughs> daddy lifestyle, hubby lifestyle. So a lot of the times I do my writing in the morning, like roughly between like 3 to 3.30 up until about 6.30 to 7 o'clock. And I'll get my exercise things going. But in between that, that window is where I'm focusing primarily on my writing. And it took a lot of time to even get that discipline down and the routine to follow um, and then later in the day, like during the day um, is where I try to focus on, of course, I'm trying to balance the military now with the publishing side where the marketing and where we go from there. Um, but most of the time, the marketing is after work, after my work day. So let's say like five o'clock, maybe till around eight is where I'm trying to like sneak in a little bit of, um, of, of publishing or things in that regards where I can focus more as a publisher than a writer. The, the idea of writing and editing and any of that stuff for my particular work, I have to <laughs> shove it to the side. I always heard this one of these publishers, um, one of these authors I had met, she had mentioned that writing in this or the book industry is pretty much 50% writing and 50% everything else as right. a marketer. So, <laughs> yeah, right, so. exactly. 
And Jenny, how about you? What techniques do you use to achieve balance? I mean, you have so many books out there, so many wonderful books. Well, the, uh, what I found over the years, and I think, um, you know, it's a matter of developing, right? Because life presents challenges to us and we're not we're not the same people we were three years ago. I mean, pandemic proves that. So I think what the deal is for me to achieve balance is I have to be disciplined. And um, if I do not write my own work in the morning as Osiris does, I don't feel good the rest of the day. It doesn't matter how many people I've helped publish or how many classes I've taught. It's it's all about my writing. And I have to I had to realize that after going through a burnout and a depression that um, if I don't feed my soul, nothing else will matter. And I also have a husband who has health issues. Um, I have a brand new puppy because I lost my Murphy, who is my riding dog. And so now we have a brand new puppy who's <laughs> chewing up my house. And of course, I have three grandchildren and one on the way. And so I have to be disciplined. And what I found is, a, um, and I, I know I'm pitching this, okay, for him, but Cal Newport has this, um, this oh. organizer app that it's called the time block planner and i just you know everybody finds what they want um to help them but this is just great because it's bigger than my calendar and it gives you room for tasks and ideas and room to to jot down whatever it is you're having to work on and i found that it's much better than these lists that i was keeping which go on for pages, right? And then by the time I finished, they're all mixed up. Like I might have call Cheryl in the the first segment, and then but then there's something having to do with Cheryl, like twelve things down. And I thought <laughs> I can't be doing this listing thing; it's just not working. So the time block planner is helpful because if you have these projects, like let's say um, I'm working on a poetry book for someone, or I'm working on producing a novel for someone and all those related tasks, I can keep them in one time block. And then I can just uh, move that over to whatever date I'm working on it. And um, that kind of, you need an organizer like that because otherwise, well, I, I don't even want to show you my desk, everybody, but my desk is a mess and I have to have some place I can go that is not my desk. Understood. <laughs> so what have been some of the pitfalls that you have encountered in doing the, the publishing and the writing? I don't know who you want to open up to. <laughs> like, um, I suppose I'll probably, I, I can uh, go first. Um, I know uh, Jenny has far more experience, so she. I'm, I'm interested in hearing her story as well. But for me, the pitfall, a lot of the pitfalls just came from pure exhaustion with everything, trying to find a balance with so much. Like, I have to get up so early in order to even in order to to feed my spirit with the things that I want to do. It's the only time where I have peace and quiet is in the morning and that can be exhausting because a lot of times my children um and in work and in in the hustle of the military's lifestyle will keep you drained I work in a mental health clinic and I'm a, I do substance abuse counseling so a lot of that it is it, it's draining it's emotionally draining and then trying to come home and then take care of your family um which is also us fulfilling but the pitfalls for me is just I think it, it came from one exhaustion to um, not seeing things materialize like you would hope you wait weeks, sometimes months, and sometimes even some years before you even see any sort of results. And it can be really debilitating. You can lose a lot of um, a lot of uh, motivation. I, I'm, I'm intrinsically motivated. Um, but even then, um, I oftentimes will question, is this even going to be something that people will gravitate to? Is what I'm trying to put out, this message of what I'm trying to put out to the world, Will it even materialize? And then when I have it out, will there be a, will there be people that comes? And then there's that whole other aspect of trying to advertise and continuously market yourself. And when uh, 
it, it, it begins to um, begin. It, it can be so much. Like I remember when I actually met both yourself and Jenny, and I was at we were at Berkeley in that Bay Area Book Festival, and I remember it was it. I, I didn't even get to stay the whole time because I had to go back home and take care of my children. I think one of them was sick at the time. And then I had to get prepared for work the following day. So I would say my pitfalls just come from exhaustion of trying to really trying to find balance between writing, husband, father, <laughs> military, which is like this, and then myself. So so what have been what have what would you say has been your greatest reward? Oh, in as an author or just in general. <laughs> Just in, as an author and a publisher, what would Ooh. you what would you put at the top of the list as your greatest reward? People actually, I say one of them is Barnes and Noble. Being able to get my book into, like, get it myself. I always heard that was one of the hardest things to do. Traditional publishers, I had to actually reach out and see, and they were going to traditionally publishing where they needed traditional publishers. Um, to get their books into their bookstores. So that was one of the biggest rewards was being able to get myself and all my hard work and sleepless nights and research um, of trying to fight to get my stuff into that bookstore just so I know the message can get can spread across the world a lot a lot more. That was one of the biggest rewards, I would say, that I have um, as an author. I, I, I want to I, I, I oh. come back to that. I want to come back to that story, by okay. the way. Um, but let me let me get Jenny in here, and then I want to come back to that. I want you to tell that story briefly of how you did Barnes, how you got into Barnes and Noble, because I see there's a question that has popped up that people, someone wants to know a little bit more about the business aspects, and I think that story um, gets a little bit more into that particular question. Um, so Jenny, what have been some of the um, your your pitfalls and uh, your most uh, wonderful reward? So the positives, of course, are being able to um, to take someone who has never been published and put them into print. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also a copy editor. So and I got my um, my copy editing certificate from UC San Diego. And I found that that was very important because copy editing isn't just about grammar correction. It's a lot about style and it's a lot about helping an author, uh, you know, provide you with a manuscript and then helping them prepare it so that, you know, the general public, as Cyrus is saying, um, in um, Barnes and Noble will pick, pick our books up and not compare it to a traditionally published book to have a book with our imprint and you know all of the contents that mimic if you will a traditionally published book mm -hmm. and and that is definitely possible uh through us um, and that's what we aim to guarantee so i think that is my greatest reward is is having achieved this for people um, but the pitfalls for me always lie in getting information out in advertising. That seems to be the not not just the hardest thing for me, but also the lowest priority. And <laughs> it actually is the most important thing is to keep your message going, not only about yourself as the author, but also about your publishing. And um so what's happened for me is the writing community that I'm involved with, the people that I teach through my um, writers and artists classes, they have become the community that essentially provide me with the task of publication. So that, because I'm not sure even at, at this time, if I could handle more than three contracts a year, you know, either for, for copy editing or for publication, because there's a lot of work involved. And I'm a boutique press, meaning I want my standards to be extremely high. And I want the things that that we all want, that our books look so professional. Yeah, very, very true. That professionalism is important. Um, and that, that kind of segues right into that, the story I want Osiris to tell. If you could tell us briefly, Osiris, you know, we're talking about the 
the marketing and the business of doing all of this, a piece of the biggest piece of the business, as you as you're saying, Jenny, is making sure that people know what you're doing and that your work is out there to be seen. And uh, one of the places that it's seen, of course, is still in the bookstores. So Osiris, how did you get your book into Barnes and Noble? Oh man, so this this one, this was hard. This was, I mean, like nothing comes easy. And I think the easier it is, the more, I guess, the less attracted I am to it. I like difficulties, but with Barnes and Noble, um, I had to one, have all the materials you need that traditional publish, a traditionally published book has. That includes the barcode on the back, the ISBN, that includes a copyright page, that includes making sure the format was correctly. The only thing I did differently with my book was in my poetry book, um, Sacred, um, I don't have it page numbered. And that was actually done intentionally. My idea behind it was right. I didn't want it to be anyone's ripping through, reading through and say, hey, I'm on page 20. How many more pages do I have left until page 40? or anything like that. I just wanted it to be kind of like a picture book where you open it, you read it, and you can close it, bookmark it, and boom. But I had to go, one, find a store, find the Barnes & Noble that I was interested in, um, which was the one in Roseville, California. That's the one that's closest to where I live at. Um, so um, I reached out to Roseville uh, via phone, talked to them over the phone. They said, hey, um, you know, give me, they gave me an email, and they said, just, just um, talk to the store manager through the email, see what you want to do. So I sent the email to that store manager like roughly in January or February. Didn't hear anything back. But then I was such a frequent shopper there that I, when I went there, I just said, hey, I'm going to go look for this person. People are more prone to actually like give you a response face to face. And um, I'm a really friendly person. And so um, I just walked in. I was asking, hey, man, please speak to the store manager. I wanted to talk to he or she about uh, potentially getting my book into your bookstore. So they went and got the store manager. I spoke with her. She said, hey, um, right now we aren't accepting Right now, we aren't accepting any sort of books. Um, so reach back to, well, no, they said right now, we're not accepting any sort of um, authors in their books. So please reach out to us in March timeframe. So they were going through a different phase. I think the way that they were getting books in from independently published um, companies and on indie authors, it's, it ceased, World, uh, uh, at least nationwide. And so in March, I came there in March, talked to them again. Um, they asked for my ISBN. My, um, they asked for um, the book. They needed at least three copies of the book because I think they wanted to review it. Um, then they needed the ISBN um, and, you know, that whole package. So I know it's kind of a little bit long winded, but I guess to kind of shorten the story, um, I have to pretty much sell myself and tell them this. And I came there with everything. So like um, the book. So this right here, for those who are, are watching this barcode. So um, on this website called Balker.com is where um, most publishing companies, they go through and they purchase ISBNs there in bulk, and they also purchase barcodes. It's important to have a, your own barcode, um, especially if you're independently published or at least self-published because you can just bring it to the bookstore because they need something to scan it in and they need your, you need to have your own ISBN that's, that's recognized across the country. Otherwise, many people go through like Amazon and they go through... Um, you know, different, different things. And it gives you their own ISBN and it's multiple attached. So, yep. So after that conversation with them, they gave me a shot and it, and it worked out. Yeah. <laughs> for it, being long it sure did. <laughs> yeah. So now I'm in three Barnes and Nobles as of yesterday. Oh, that is so cool. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Jenny, Jenny, do you have a, a business related story? Anything to add? Um, well, you know, I, I, uh, Let's see, business related story. Anything to add? Oh, oh, okay. Um, well, um, what I like to do is I I like to to stack my work so that you you know I'm already through the end of 2024 um, with my calendaring because I've had people approach me to uh, to publish or to copy edit. And uh, so I, I mean, you know how people will just come up to you. Oh, you know, would you, pu you know, publish my flash fiction collection? And you're like, oh, sure. Because, you know, you love this person. Well, you can't really do that. I mean, you can't just promise <laughs> your friends the world because the calendar rules. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So, um, so I have learned that I have to segment out. I have just as, as regular editors do, you have to have a queue and people have to make a deposit uh, for whatever work that they want you to do, whether it is copy editing or if they want you to publish the book. And um, it takes time. You also have to remind the authors that this is not an overnight thing um, because some authors, they're not, they just want to cl- flick the switch and they're going to be on Amazon and forget it. Yeah. So I, you know, I always remind them if you want the quality and you want to have the copy editing done and you want to have this really beautiful book to present, then it is going to take more time. So there's a whole um, conversation that has to take place between the publisher and the author. That's really important also to tell people that the average a self-published author in America sells 100 books or fewer. And that's a cruel reality. But there are so many books published every year. I don't even know what the number is anymore. I used to know it used to be 500,000, but I, you know, I would have to check to see how many books are published on Amazon every year, but it's something like that. And so, you know, who are you or me in comparison to all these fish in the sea? So you have to really have that quality book ready. Um, So that's, that's the other thing publishing related that I wanted to add. Also, in terms of Barnes and Noble and so forth, um, now if you publish on Ingram Spark, they will, uh, Ingram Spark as well as Amazon, you will be able to um, to cover your uh, your regular bookstores like Barnes and Noble and also your small independent published uh, or independent bookstores, and they will be able to order from the Ingram catalog. So oh, um, that is something also to know. And I agree with Osiris that you go into the ocean of Barnes and Noble and ask for them to carry your book. I've done that myself. And it is, you know, let's put it this way. I had to have my big girl boots on, you know, uh, because you have to really show them the quality of what it is you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. So true. So true. So, Alyssa. Do we have any questions in the chat? I see a couple that popped up. We are popping off in the chat. We have lots of juicy questions today for this fabulous conversation. I've used the word fabulous too many times. I have to stop. Um, <laughs> That's a, good word. A, a great like combo it. and a really interesting topic. And so we have a lot of um, participants with questions, some um, that the topics have been touched on a little bit, but I'll just go in order that they've arrived and, and we can uh, cover as much as possible. Our first question in the chat comes from Bettina. How far away do Ginny and Osiris travel to promote their books? Do they only go to local events such as the Berkeley Book Festival? So whichever one of you would like to do that one first. Farthest I've gone, oops. The farthest I've gone is Colorado. Um, I went to a the Historical Novel Society Conference and um, had my books at a table there and I was on a panel. Um, I've also gone to Texas and uh, and uh, Santa Fe, um, but I think it's, it's not even a matter of how far you go, but what it is you want to achieve. For example, um, I love the Bay Area audiences because uh, for historical fiction, they tend to love the history. And I do write about San Francisco. So, mm-hmm. you know, I have a purpose in in doing Bay Area events because I know that so many of the readers are familiar with the places I write about and the history. So I think you kind of have to decide where it is you want to be. My friend Anara Gard who is a a well-known author and um, has won many awards. She she has a connection with Chicago because that is where she grew up, went to college and her books take place in Chicago, you see? So I think, you know, it's determining where your audience is. 
Mm-hmm. And Osiris, how far have you gone? Um, physically, it was actually it was was Berkeley where I met you both. At. <laughs> um, uh, I did uh, I did do like a virtual um uh, event um that went that was based out of New York. It was poetry based, but yeah, actually physically going and promote. I mean, I did promote it there too, but physically going and promoting it with people, it was Berkeley, which for me is about three hours from where I live at right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was but it, was, it, it was fun it was it was yeah. it was a lot of fun i had a good time i think it, i can't remember if it was um um how how many hours it was because again like i mentioned earlier i didn't stay they get to stay for the entire thing um uh, but yes and it was worth it too oh yes it was yeah yes it was did, did we have any more questions to listen in the chat lots of questions okay um this was touched on a smidge but um maybe it could be uh, expanded upon. Our question comes from Gabrielle. I would like to know more on the business of publishing and marketing. Can the author speak on how to do this side of the equation? As writers, we all know how to write. It's the other part we need help from experienced people. Yeah, okay. So I for for me, that actually was another piece that I had struggled with for a long time, and I'm just now getting better at it. Um, but for me, um, I'd say, one, you got to know your audience. I once heard a phrase that if you're doing it for, if you're doing it for everyone, you're really doing it for no one. So you got to be specific as to who you're targeting. So like for my, for my children's book, which is way different than my poetry books, um, there's an audience and what age range. So for me, I knew that this particular children's book was from zero to eight. Okay, cool. So this demographic is I can hit children that's in school or not. Sorry, let me rephrase that. Not hit children, but I can um I can like speak with children <laughs> um that is in an elementary school. That's my demographic right there for that book. Okay, now I know who to market to. Now I know what now how do I need to make like the promotional um um the promotional work? Okay, cool. This is gonna come maybe using big bold letters, colorful letters, uh, things that grabs the children's attention. For poetry, what type of poetry am I doing? My stuff really focuses more on motivation and also on uh, mental health issues. Okay, so now we gotta we gotta get out of the window of what age range really does this is this applicable to, and then you just kind of go from there, and then also knowing where you want to go. Do you do you excel better with social media promotions? Do you do better with actually you know face to face promotions? Kind of like going out to festivals and having those marketing opportunities, um, and do you have business partners or do you know people in the business who may know other people that, Hey, um, do you mind helping me out? I can help you out, you know, vice versa. Um, so I don't know if that necessarily answers the question, but it's really it, what matters most is one, knowing your audience two, knowing where the audience actually lies at, you know? Um, so I would say, you know, I would encourage people to do um, maybe go to YouTube, look on social media and then see what those authors are doing. Um, and see how they're doing it and then maybe emulate what they're doing until you find your own style and then kind of just grow, grow from there. That's what good I did. Advice. Good advice. How about you, Jenny? Well, I'm, I like Facebook uh, it, 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 to me, it, you know, and I think that's the one thing you have to find what fits your personality. Yeah. I'm just not a Twitter girl. I've tried Twitter. I've tried Twitter, Twitter ads um, and I, I like interaction. I like a little more comments. You know, I like to carry on just like today. I like a conversation. Um, so Facebook fits me. And I really like Facebook groups. And I have found, uh, for example, the Tattered Pages um, author group. And on Wednesdays, they do allow you to post uh, something about yourself, something about your writing. And that's not the only Facebook group. I mean, you could look up um, a historical fiction group, uh, whatever your genre is in particular. Uh, for And I, Cyrus has touched on this with, you know, whether you're writing children's books or whether you're writing literary fiction, you have to know um, where your readers are and also where the writers are. So I, I really try to narrow that down with Facebook groups. And I just did a lot of experimental searches until I could find these groups and then abide by their rules, join them and um, make myself a positive member. So you do that by, you know, by not abandoning these people, you have to be there a lot. 
And for example, Tattered Pages runs these special events where you actually can make up um, fun advertisements for your work or for the work of whoever you're publishing, if you're a publisher, and that garners attention. You can actually offer freebies uh, and run little contests. You know, if somebody answers so many, asks so many questions in the comment, then they get uh, they get a free book. And of course, uh, so many of them, um, you can run these specials so that it, it also garners readership. And then these people will, will um, friend you and so forth. And the same people are on Instagram. Um, and I now have heard that, and I'm woefully behind on this, but I know um, Facebook is now also running a form of Twitter um, so that it could carry over to, to that. But everybody has their different, uh, you know, ways. Some people love YouTube. I have a group I mean, I have a, a writing group member who absolutely loves YouTube and she has all sorts of videos on YouTube. So it, it sort of depends on, uh, as Osiris was saying, it depends on your audience and it depends on your purpose. Mm -hmm. And then it also depends on the subject matter you're covering in your book. Um, and, and whether or not your voice finds an affinity out there with other groups of people. Uh, and you have to be, you have to be really razor sharp focused on, on that affinity because you can waste a lot of time trying to market to places that will never have an interest in what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And everyone has something interesting to say. Just find the, just you need to work to find the places where it resonates. Uh, more on the chat, Alyssa? Absolutely. Um, and just because of time and there's so many juicy questions, I'm going to be a little judicious and try to combine a couple topics, if that's okay. Sure. Um, uh, I, a little bit of a combo question from our participants, Laurel and uh, Jen, about how to anticipate your work, both as a writer, as an author, and a publisher. And what are you asking aspiring authors in order to ascertain at what point their manuscript is at? Um, so I thought that might be an interesting uh, combo. Oh, wow, that's a, that's, that's a good one. Okay, um, so how to anticipate. Um, are they are they asking like how to anticipate if it's gonna be good or how and anticipate on like when is it gonna release? I'm not as exactly sure the intention. The original question was, this is fabulous. So also using that word of the day, thank you. Can you share <laughs> how to how you anticipate your work as an author and publisher will be affected by the upcoming AI effects? And then um, oh. Ginny, what do mm -hmm. you ask aspiring authors in order to ascertain what point their manuscript is at? I ask you as a copy editor, what does that line of questioning look like? So, okay, so I'll take um, that one, Osiris, and then maybe you can handle the other part. Okay. Um, as a copy editor, I need to have a manuscript uh, to look at that is um, as good as the author can make it, um, that is professionally done, um, that is uh, formatted in 12 font Times New Roman, uh, 0.5 font. Um, uh, margins on all sides is paginated and is the author's best work up to that point. So uh, that work should have gone through a uh, critique group, uh, have gone through at least a first and second draft, if we're lucky, um, and, you know, have really been vetted before hitting um, the eyes of an, a copy editor because the copy editor will take the first 30 pages and will make a decision as to whether or not they accept the work based on that first 30 pages. And, um, and the copy editor, very much like an acquisitions editor at a publishing house, makes a decision as to whether or not they'll accept the work based on that. So a lot of people are not aware of that and they just think, um, oh, I'll just submit this to a copy editor. They'll take it and 
whatever, it's not that way. Copy editors have been uh, generally, especially the quality copy editor has had a lot of training and um, has been trained to do this work, this very close work. And, um, yeah. and you know, if, in order to get that, you're, you're going to have to, not you, but, you know, the aspiring author needs to be aware that, that it has to be a pretty tight manuscript. That's really good. Um, okay, well, thank you for handling that part. Um, the, the, as far as answering the first half of the question, as far as, like, how to, to anticipate, uh, like, I guess, the future of this AI, AI um, I say that I guess the biggest challenge that might come with the 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 world of AI is the um the production rate um for in which the books will be produced. So like I don't know, I, I've never actually used one of those AI programs before, but from what I've heard, you can spit in some sort of a subject matter in a specific program that's AI based, and it can just generate whatever you need it to generate. And um, I don't think there's purity. And that in comparison to the actual human behind the work. Now, maybe the person who's, I, I guess, where the AI work is going into, um, maybe there's there could be some apprehension as to how can I compete with an AI. But the AI can't go out there and promote itself. The AI can't go out there and touch people and it can't meet readers. The AI can't do that stuff. Yeah, it can produce the work, um, but AI's voices may or may not sound a little similar as long as you as the author know that you can produce you have your own voice your own unique voice and you also get out there put a face to the name get behind the camera get out there and be in person that is um that is what would separate you as the author from the ai so i guess i guess in short anticipating ai's work just know it's coming but just know it can't compete with actual people um, and the art and the, and the author behind the work. Hope that and, that. I, and, and I would echo that. I, I think that um, we know it's coming. It's going to be used for a lot of different reasons, purposes. Um, some people use it as a tool. Some people use it as a substitute. But as Osiris has just said, it can never substitute for the human purpose, the human person, the voice inside, the soul, um, and it would, will never have your individual voice, which is what you as a writer bring to the art. I would also like to say about oh. AI that that um, AI has a recognizable. Uh, it's interesting. It's it's recognizable lack of tone. Mm. So, for example, um, because I have experimented with it. I mean, I have to, I'm a copy editor. I have to know what's going on in the world of editing and publishing. And I have to know what's happening with AI. So I've been really experimenting. And let's say you put in um, to AI, write a scene between John and Mary as they discuss um, the renovation of their garage. What's going to happen is it's going to Bill, spin out something that at face value looks pretty good. But when you break it down, it, it as Osiris is pointing out, it doesn't have voice. It doesn't have a tone. It doesn't really have a purpose. And in essence, it doesn't have a spirit. Right. And um, so the only reason to look at that would be if, for example, you need ideas. You know, I um, I want to write a scene and I wonder what another person might come up with in terms of this. And then perhaps think, hmm, I wonder if that's really how it would be in their dialogue and conversation setting or would I like to do it uh, slightly differently. But there is a danger in copy pasting AI and putting it into your novel in progress mm -hmm. because several contests that I have just scanned, content, uh, different book contests are now stating uh, you are immediately disqualified if it is found you used AI in preparation yep. or in the writing of this manuscript. Right. And so you will, I mean, and they will find you because it's not that difficult to do a search, even using AI. That's you know? exactly right. 
was this paragraph you know done using it oh yes yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that the voice and the spirit are, are missing that you're you yep. are completely correct do we have uh, time for one more question, Alyssa? Yeah, I was hoping to just do one more. We've gotten a couple questions or inquiries about social media, uh, how much social media um, uh, you're you're Thanks. utilizing, what's necessary, when do you know it's enough that it's working, um, how are you balancing how much uh, promotion you're doing with your publishing and your authorship, and maybe that will be our last audience Q&A, and then we can begin to wind down. Okay, so um, for me, this question won't necessarily pertain to me as I don't use social media um, other than my own website, which I don't know if we're allowed to make mentions of like our, our websites or anything like that on here. Um, will I be able to share a link actually so people can go there? Put, put okay. it in the chat. Put it in the chat. Okay, I'll put it in. The, I'll put my stuff in the chat. Um, so I mean, I guess that's a form of social media. Um, maybe um, Jenny will probably have more experience with what, or what more experience with this. But we can also um, add. We'll we'll add your uh your uh websites back in the chat. We did it towards the beginning, but we will definitely do it again before we're finished. So you can focus, and we'll pop things um, more in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, it's gonna be a little newsletter thing that pops up there. Feel free to subscribe, put your email there, and then I can always talk to you all separate. But um. As far as I go, different authors who I've met that actually use social media, they said that it um, it helps them keep a real close connection with their reader. The one thing I will recommend um, is if you are going to use social media, accompany that with an actual website that you own the domain to. Because if anything happens to those social media platforms, and it can happen, yeah. they can snatch away or they can do it. Something can go wrong. And then all of a sudden the audience that you have with your social media will go and go bye-bye. And if you don't have your own website where you can actually direct your readers to, um, there's no way that they can keep up with you. Um, You'll end up just falling off into the, into the abyss, if you will. So um, I would say that social media has been helpful for people who also have a website. Um, and I will say, you know, just whatever website you feel is, 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 is good or whatever social media platform. For me, I'm actually starting to do it with YouTube. I used to do YouTube years ago. And it's kind of like what Jenny said, that interaction. I, I like to be able to talk and feel like people can see me. Um, go with where you know it can be effective. I know TikTok is a pretty big thing right now, too. Um, but go with where you're comfortable and where you feel is the most effective. Um, but again, I can't necessarily speak from actual experience with social media. I can speak, however, from, from having my own website and telling, and I can tell you that having your own website, having a, e- a dedicated email list that people go to your website and sign up for, um, and you keep in contact with them. I generally try to send out weekly to bi-weekly emails um, just to keep people abreast of what's going on and let them know this is what's coming, this is what I've got work going on, and this is my family, um, and these are the different things that's happening. So. Yeah, I'll say that. Just if you have social media, accompany that with uh, a website. Right. I like right. that. I like that. Yeah. Um, I also really would echo um, how do you know it's working is when you see the bumps uh, in your sales. And um, Amazon provides you with that information right, readily. So uh, once you your book is up on Amazon, you're going to see immediately um, so let's say you do a Facebook adver- advertisement or Amazon also has opportunities for you to run specials on your book with various uh, price points. In addition, you can do Amazon ads and Amazon is very helpful with telling you how to do that. And so um, so in addition to those, because you're going to see bumps in your sales, uh, depending on the effort that you do uh, online with your marketing And also, I would echo Osiris, the email list is absolutely crucial. And um, so I use um, MailChimp uh, because it allows you to have 500 uh, email followers. But you you might want to check because they're very competitive. Actually, had I known this, I would have started my email uh, newsletter before I ever published. Yeah, I really would have. Yeah. I would have started garnering followers, uh, just sending it out to friends and saying, please share this newsletter with, with, you know, and just tell them about your journey as an aspiring author. And that way, when you first publish your book, your platform is already laid 
and mm-hmm. people will already know you. That's the yeah. most important thing. If and I, can and echo, I, would, I'm sorry. I, I would also suggest that when you do your website um, and you do your, your lists and uh, your YouTube and whatever, make sure that you link every link to the link to the link to the link. Mm-hmm. Link it all up so that you have a flow that no matter where people go, they can connect to another link that shows another aspect of you and your work. Mm-hmm. I want I wanted to add what to that too, uh, um, Cheryl. Is there's this website it's called books to read.com. Um, on there you can actually put uh, you go straight to that website. You can have all the links pretty much compiled into one. Um, it, it'll be separate separate by um, per icon as well. So um, that's also an option. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, um, to say as well um, is um, if you are going to just do your, I know we're pretty short on time. Sorry, I want to say this real quick. If, if you are pretty short on time with, um, not short on time, if you are um, looking to do your own email list, um, I would say try not, I, I wouldn't get in the rhythm of sending out every like every week if you don't necessarily have something to say. Um, it can also become spam in a, in a sense. And so it, this is just, a, in my opinion, that if you are going to send, I would say at least bi-weekly and at least have some sort of content to produce and um, make sure that the people that's like reading um, your material, you kind of give them some sort of incentive with it. Like, hey, if you sign up for my thing, I'll give you all free copies. Um, maybe you can all review my book, which also, once your book is published, you want to continuously promote that. I, I saw Stephen King, not in person, recently, he still promotes his, his book, Carrie. He still That's promotes right. a lot of his old books. That's right. His debut. So you always want to continuously promote your books every step of the way. And you also, the lifeline of your books is go, will be the reviews. And I'm not saying Barnes & Noble's website will be the spot. Um, many people buy their books from Barnes & Noble a great deal. Others, a lot of them buy them from Amazon. You might hear a lot of authors say, hey, can I get a review from you on my Amazon account? Meanwhile, you look on Barnes & Noble's website and you don't have any reviews. But in person, your books are actually selling well there. So I would say just keep promoting yourself um, at all times um, and sell yourself and take a chance on yourself. And then that that's all I got. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. So any uh, closing thoughts from either of you? I just want to say, uh, give my thanks uh, to um, to Alyssa, to Nico for helping uh, make this possible, to the Mechanics Institute, who are so, um, so important, such a long history in San Francisco, um, to uh, Osiris for all of his wisdom. And I want to thank Cheryl Bees-Boutte, my good associate friend and fellow author, for such a warm environment. And thanks to all of you who came and, um, you know, and provided those wonderful questions today. Mm-hmm. And thank you. Yes. And um, um, yes, indeed. I want to just, I also want to echo that. It was it was great meeting you both, uh, Jenny and Cheryl, back in Berkeley. Um, hopefully we can do more things together here. Thank you as well, um, uh, Alyssa, for the just contacting us and getting this whole thing, you know, put together. And those who are attending in the chat, thank you all as well. Um, me, it's it's... I'm really grateful to be able to have platforms to just talk to people and spread the word. The reason why I write, um, the reason why I like to do poetry is I, I feel like I have a message to, to say. Um, a lot of things that I talk about is, ver- is, 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 on, a, is on the verge of mental health issues. In fact, I have another book coming out next month called Dear Sick Mental Virus. And I'll make sure I let everybody know it's a poetry book. And that was specifically about emotional abuse, domestic violence, and that whole shebang. Um, um, and then my children's books, I want to just tell stories that help children, you know, get lost in the world and just have a good time in it. Um, yeah. So uh, I just I just love the, the space of being around other authors and other people in this medium. Um, and that we always unite. I never, ever sense any ill will. I always feel like it's supportive. And I would say if anybody has a dream, keep pushing. Um, don't quit and really take a chance on yourself. If you want to go to those big bookstores, you go up to them in person and tell them why they should have you and don't give them a, a don't, don't have them doubt you at all. And yeah. So, Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you both uh, Jenny and Osiris for all you do for the writer and the reader. You got it covered. Thank you so much. And thank you, Alyssa.
Uh, Y'all did the best wrap up we possibly could have imagined. So with that, we'll say a big thank you to Cheryl, our amazing moderator, uh, who month after month curates these beautiful conversations with writers from across the community. And our two featured guests today, Osiris, and Ginny Grossenbacher for joining us. Thank you so much. We hope to see you again at a Mechanics Institute event, either online or in person. Please check out milibrary.org for more information. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Keep pushing, keep hustling, keep writing, and keep connecting with one another. That's what community is all about. Thank you and have a great Thank day. you. Night. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you all. Bye, Osiris. <laughs>